finishing up chapter 19. We've covered Bach extensively in class, and so now we're going to finish up the end of chapter 19, which is Handel, uh, with this video lecture. And the homework was passed out in class on Friday. You'll need this video lecture to complete that homework. It is due on Monday. So, Handel, Bach's contemporary. Uh, exact contemporary, actually. They were born in the same year, 1685, in the same area of Germany. Uh, although he did live nine years longer. He lived until 1759. Handel is very different than Bach in many, many ways. Uh, he was a much more international composer. He, uh, he was primarily known for opera, which Bach did not, if you remember, Bach did not compose any operas, and oratorio. And while Bach did write um, a few oratory uh, he, uh, this is not something he delved into extensively. So, Handel also differs from Bach in that Handel was recognized as a great composer during his time, and he's one of the few composers whose music has more or less always been in the repertoire. His oratorios continue to be sung after his death, uh, so there's really not been an extensive period of time where Handel's music has not been performed. He was born, as I said, in Germany. He was trained originally in Germany in organ, harpsichord, counterpoint, and current styles. And then he moved to Italy. He lived in Italy uh, from the time he was 21 until 25, where he studied Italian opera extensively, um, met and studied with any number of Italian composers. You can see, as the book states, he traveled more extensively than Vivaldi, Rameau, and Bach which kind of makes sense if you think of these four gentlemen as being the cornerstones of the second half of the Baroque. Vivaldi, inarguably Italian, wrote in the Italian style. Rameau, paragon of the French Baroque with Lully and Bach, a paragon of the German Baroque. Handel had more of an international flair. So, born in Germany, trained in Germany, moved to Italy where he lived for four years and studied opera, and then he moved to London. And this is where he became really famous and spent the majority of his career. When he was in London, he worked for various members of the nobility. And he was revered by the British public. He's actually buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, if you ever go to Westminster Abbey, if you ever go to London, you go to Westminster Abbey, uh, very close to the Houses of Parliament. They're just amazing, the number of famous people that are buried in there. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, obviously, Purcell, Henry Purcell, I think we talked about, is, uh, is actually buried underneath the organ, if I remember correctly. Famous painting of Handel. Handel's a relatively young man. Interesting enough, one of the only paintings that's in the entire book where, from the Baroque where he's not wearing a wig. Okay, major works. Handel is best known for his English oratorios, his Italian operas, and some instrumental music. So, he wrote over 20 oratorios, the most famous of which are Messiah, Saul, Israel and Egypt, Samson. Um, he wrote 40 Italian operas, the most famous of which is Julius Caesar, uh, in Italian of course. Cantatas, the original Italian form of the cantata, not the, um, the German Lutheran cantata that we talked about when we were talking about Bach. Concerti, um, trio sonatas, solo sonatas, many, many keyboard pieces, and then two large collections of orchestral music, the water music and music for the royal fireworks. In 1710, very soon after moving to London, he became the music director for the Elector of Hanover. The Elector of Hanover eventually became King George I. Um, he was the heir to the British throne. So, in 1714, Handel worked directly for the king, who doubled his yearly salary when he became king. When he first moved to London, he was best known for writing his Italian operas. Rinaldo, 1711, he brought Italian opera to London and was, became very famous for that. Um, in the 1710s, they staged a, a handle opera every year, and then in 1718, 1719, they actually founded a, uh, an opera company, the Royal Academy of Music, which produced Italian operas. Handel was the music director. 
So from 1720 to 1728, he was the music director of the Royal Academy of Music, which was a, an Italian opera company. As music director, Handel wrote many of the operas and was also in charge of the productions. Of course, as I said, Handel wrote over 40 operas, but uh, Julius Caesar, which he wrote in 1724, is his far and away his best known opera to this day. So Handel's operas, by this time, we've gone away from the early Baroque conceit of opera being primarily Greek mythology. Um, and some early operas were based on Roman history or Roman legends. So Handel did follow, uh, to some degree, the Roman genre, if you will. Um, what Handel became really known for was developing the recitative. He essentially wrote two different kinds of recitative. The dry recitative, the recitativo secco, which is essentially just a continual accompaniment and is very speech-like. So it's, it's dry, it's simple. The accompaniment is just a continual and it is very simple rhythmically. The focus is almost entirely on the text. You can really advance the plot in a recitativo secco. Um, accompaniato, the accompanied recitative, is actually accompanied by the full orchestra and utilizes the orchestra to emphasize dramatic moments in the text. Um, so the recitativo secco is almost a soliloquy. It's, it's just primarily focused on the text, whereas the re accompanying recitative is, I won't say it's like an aria because it's really not, but it, it's kind of in between the point of the recitative to advance the plot give you information and the point of the aria to express emotion, the accompanied recitative kind of expresses emotion while advancing the plot, if you will. His arias, primarily da capo arias, we've talked about the da capo form extensively in class. Um, and remember we talked about this whole push and pull between emphasis on the text or emphasis on the, uh, the show. Handel understood that, you know, he needed to sell tickets and they he would write a lot of arias and of course the more important the singer and the more important the role, the more arias that character would have. This is actually where we come up with the concept of prima donna, which literally means first lady. She's the lead singer and would have the most arias. Um, some of you who have sung Handel understand that he wrote very melismatic passages in many of his arias and so many of these arias written for the uh, especially for the prima donna featured these brilliant ornaments extended range and brilliant technical ornaments and melismas which were known as coloratura and that's become an entire style of soprano writing coloratura soprano which became stayed very popular Mozart wrote very famous coloratura all the way through Rossini and into the uh, into modern day. So in 1729, the Royal Academy dissolved. They just closed it down, and Handel started his own opera company. And it's fairly remarkable that Handel was actually functioning as a free agent at this point without specific patronage of a member of the nobility or of the church. Um, he started his own opera company, which meant he wrote the operas. He had to secure performance space. He had to hire the orchestra, he had to hire the singers, he had to take care of the advertising, he had to take care of hiring people to build the sets and do the costuming and all of that. And then he sold tickets. And if he made more money selling tickets than it cost him to stage the production, well, then he got to eat that week and make another one. So his early major successes were actually with a famous castrato of the time, um, Senesino. Uh, in 1733, Senesino actually left his opera company, joined another opera company, and then basically Handel's company and this other opera company bankrupted each other in competition by trying to one-up one up each other all the time. Eventually, they both went out of business, which, and we will in class, we will listen to some music from Handel's Julius Caesar. Um, so this actually led, the bankruptcy of his opera company led Handel to 
basically invent a new form, the English oratorio. Oratorios were sacred because they're based on Bible stories, although they were not written to be performed during church services like a cantata. Instead, they were standalone entertainments. They were long. So, oratorios originally were Italian. Handel started writing them in English. Remember, he was living in England at the time. Uh, they were similar in many ways to, uh, to opera because they had arias and recitatives and choruses and orchestral interludes at times. But unlike Italian opera at the time, Italian oratorios also had elements drawn from the German Passion. If you remember, Bach wrote his Passions. Um, the English Mask. I don't think we've really talked about the English Mask. Um, an English Mask is uh, an, a large-scale entertainment that involves singing, but also involves dancing. Um, you remember what the anthem is in English music. Greek tragedy. So, oratorios, Italian oratorios were performed in theaters, not performed in church. Handel kind of synthesized all of this stuff, invented the English oratorio. Musically, the main difference between his oratorios and Italian oratorios was a much larger emphasis on the chorus. Um, probably from his German background, he was trained in Germany. He was familiar with the uh, Lutheran choral traditions, the chorales, the um, cantatas that Bach later wrote based on these maybe based on these chorales. And so the chorus had an integral part. Participating in the action, narrating the story, and commenting on events. Think all the way back to when we talked about the invention of opera and uh, Greek mythology, the, the original Greek dramas. The Greek chorus does not participate in the action. It comments on the action and narrates. Uh, in Handel's case, he used these elements as well as having the chorus be part of the action. His choir music is less contrapuntal. Than Bach. Bach's music is extremely contrapuntal, utilizing a lot of imitative polyphony. Uh, Handel did sometimes utilize an imitative polyphony, if you think, and we've talked about this in class already, right in the middle of the Alleluia Chorus from Messiah, bang, he throws in a fugue. But if you really look, sit down and look at it, it's short and it's fairly simple. It is not an overly complex fugue, certainly not compared to Bach's. So what Handel frequently did is he would alternate homophonic and imitative polyphonic textures. Handel's first oratorio, which he wrote in 1718, he premiered it in London, 1732. Esther, Saul in 1739, we're going to listen to movements of Saul. Um, his most famous oratorio, which is also his, an unusual oratorio for Handel. Handel's oratorios typically have two things in common. Number one, they were Old Testament. They were stories from the Old Testament. Number two, they tended to be complete dramas. Like you could literally take a Handel oratorio and stage it, turn it into an opera, because it's a complete storyline. Handel's most famous oratorio, Messiah, which written in 1741, was premiered in Dublin, Ireland. Um, differs in that, obviously, with the subject Messiah, it is not Old Testament, it is New Testament, and it was not, it's not a complete chronological telling of Jesus' story. Instead, it's a series of movements, um, parables, uh, various contemplations about Jesus and Christianity in general. It is not a complete chronological narrative. It starts with the French Overture. You remember the French Overture? I'm going to ask you about the French Overture on Monday, I think. It includes recitatives and da capo arias drawn from the Italian style. It has choral fugues, just like the German style, and it has choral anthems, just like the English anthem for the Anglican church. Handel's oratorios were performed during the Lenten season in London. Um, they were much cheaper to stage than operas because they required no costumes, no sets, no staging. Sometimes they um, were performed in theaters. Sometimes they were performed in churches. There was actually a debate about whether or not you should perform oratorios in churches. Um, because these were English, he would hire English singers to sing the lead, which meant it was more 
financially doable because the English singers did not command the fees of the famous Italian singers. So, in many ways, the English oratorio was a... He invented this genre, which is incredibly well-loved today, but it's kind of financial. It was just much cheaper to produce oratorios than operas. They were also very attractive to the middle class. And we will, of course, break down one of his oratorios during class time on Monday. So in addition to his Italian operas and his English oratorios, which he's most famous for, he also wrote a great deal of instrumental music. Um, chamber music, harpsichord suites, remember what a suite is, solo sonatas, trio sonatas. But his most popular instrumental music are his two suites for orchestra, the water music and the royal fireworks music. So water music was written in 1717 when he was working for King George I. There are three suites of music for string and wind instruments. They were actually written to be performed on the Thames, the, the huge river that flows through the center of London. Um, the musicians were on barges. The barges were anchored in the Thames, and uh, the musicians were on these barges for royal entertainment. Uh, water music is probably his, I would say that the most recognizable handle the individual movements are the rondo from water music, which I'll play for you in class, and the Alleluia chorus. I, th I think hands down those are the two most recognizable handle individual movements. He also wrote in 1749 uh, music for the Royal Fireworks. No explanation needed, right? It was music to accompany a fireworks show um, that the Crown was presenting. Um, Originally, just for winds, although he did add string parts. I like the music for the Royal Fireworks a great deal, actually. The overture is really, really cool. Um, so, Handel adopted British citizenry, became a citizen in 1727. While well, he studied in Germany, born in, and trained in Germany, and studied in Italy, all of his major mature output was produced in England for British audiences. Buried, as I said, in Westminster Abbey, and, as I said at the beginning of this uh, video, his oratorios have, here's that double negative, have never not been performed. They almost immediately made it into the standard repertoire before there was even really such thing as a standard repertoire. Even after Handel's death, through the rest of the 1700s, through the classical era, into the early Romantic era, through Beethoven's time, for the most part, the public demanded new music. They wanted new, uh, interesting composers, and they wanted composers to write new things. Hey, we've heard your 38th symphony. Where's your 39th symphony? Um, however, Handel's oratorios have remained popular since his death. As a matter of fact, um, that's actually his, uh, that's in Westminster Abbey. That's his tombstone in Westminster Abbey. So, We'll talk about this, I think, when we get to the um, Romantic era, but some of the earliest choruses, um, non-church non choruses in the United States, were actually founded to sing the oratorios of Handel and also Haydn. As a matter of fact, in Boston, the Handel and Haydn Society in Boston, I think, is the oldest non-religious chorus in existence. It's been around for, I think, uh, around 200 years. And it was founded, obviously, to sing the oratorios of Haydn, uh, Handel, and then later Haydn. So, wrapping up this chapter, chapter 19, Bach. Bach's music was not published during his lifetime because it was written to be performed wherever he was working. He wasn't attempting to gain European fame. And that wasn't something that was really accessible to most musicians of the time. Um, his music was known to a few core musicians, but in 1825, and we'll talk about this when I talk about Mendelssohn, and I've talked about this in class, Mendelssohn, who was living and working in Leipzig, discovered the music of Bach and revived it in 1825 or so. Um, and from that point on, Bach's music has been a major part of not only the repertoire, but teaching music as well. Other composers, however, were familiar with Bach. Uh, Mozart was introduced to Bach by uh, Baron von Zweiten. We'll talk about that when we get to Mozart. 
Mendelssohn obviously familiar with them, Schumann, Brahms. When we talk about Brahms, we'll talk about how Brahms is one of the few composers of the Romantic era who actually studied music of the Baroque and Classical eras, especially of the Baroque era, and it really led him to some very interesting things that other people at the time weren't doing. Handel, unlike Bach, was the first composer to attain permanence in the standard repertoire, starting with his oratorios and then branching out into other music. And that's it. Homework assignment is due on Monday, and then we will take the Baroque exam.